square one, right, because somehow we didn't get it right the first time, you know, all of those things. But there's a lot of meaning in that. And for our United Way, there's almost like a double entendre there, right? But square one is also the story of the power of partnerships to transform communities and United Ways. And it certainly did ours. August 30th, 2015, and I know Tom knows that date very well. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon I'm in my office, wrapping up for the day. I get a phone call. How many of you remember Paul Dabowski? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Paul calls me up, and he's a pretty jovial guy, right? Yeah. Pretty, pretty jovial. Yeah. Well, he wasn't calling to give me good news. That was the day we learned that we were one of the five United Ways impacted by the Intel decision to no longer partner with us. Poof! $2.1 million gone. Gone. That was a huge hit for us. And of that $2.1 million, about a third of it funded our operating budget. So guess what we had to do? Anybody, raise your hand, say it loud. A third of our staff, a third, across the organization, <coughs> my senior team to our, our line staff, our admin staff. No one was happy, needless to say, including me. And so we had to kind of start over. Here I was, I don't think I was two years in as CEO. I come in and the first thing I've done is work with the board to create a strategic plan, a five-year strategic plan. And at that time, you know, they were like, okay, you know, we've been doing impact work focused on education, financial stability, and health. And we were getting some outcomes, but they were eager to start to take that work to scale. The other issue was that we were investing all of our money we were the only funder. And so here we were, we're in year two of our five year strategic plan with the goal we were going to hit United Way Worldwide's goal play number one. Right? We were going to transform into an impact focused organization, and that would be our business model. We were going to go from being transactional, right, talking about how we make it possible for people to give. Well, how relevant is that? Who gets excited about that? <laughs> right? To an organization that was about community transformation. And we had this beautiful plan for how we were going to do it. And at the end of the five years, we were going to be there. Right? And we were going to take our time and talk to the community and figure out, you know, let's do a, a check-in to see if we're still focused on the right stuff. Right? No. No. We had to move fast. So after we regrouped with the, the people we had left, I had to promise the team that if they stayed with us, we could do amazing things. We had to rebuild the culture of our organization. And the first thing we did was we sat together and created some guiding principles for how we wanted our United Way to be, what we wanted the culture to be, what we wanted the climate to be. And it was extraordinary. And then we had to roll up our sleeves and figure out, as a united way, what was the best that we could do to bring about transformational change for communities and at the same time engage donors to invest in that change. 
right? So think about it. Yeah, one campaign go away. Oh, and also that year, we had another campaign, $100,000, that went away too, right? By the time it was all over, we had lost almost $2.5 million in one fiscal year. So we were hobbled. And so I rallied the board, and they came together, and it was hard. It was really hard to get them to kind of see beyond where we were. Meanwhile, we brought together the community and we asked them. We brought together nonprofits, funders, we talked to anybody who would listen to us about how we could start to really impact some of the most pressing problems in the community. And we kind of built up this kind of expertise in working in the early childhood education, right? We were doing grade level literacy work. I mean, we were leading the campaign for grade level reading. We had done all this really cool stuff. We were doing financial stability work, trying to figure out how do you lift families out of poverty. We were doing, you know, work with kids and trying to improve, you know, their health and wellness, all this stuff, small scale stuff, right? But I wanted to go big. And I needed the board to go big. And we needed to figure out, you know, how, how are we going to sustain ourselves as a United Way? I mean, how many of you can make up two and a half million dollars a year? Raise your hand. No. <laughs> Go ahead. Right? How do you do that? How do you do that? So, that's how the Square One Project was born. I wish it was a more exciting story and sexier, but it's not. Sorry. So, meanwhile, while all of that was happening, we were building our love affair with a little school district called Rolla. And here's some stats, five K through six schools, actually they have a, a, a highly rated preschool program. You can see the mix of student enrollment, 2,300 students, a minority majority school district. However, four out of 10 students were English language learners, 65% speak Spanish, 19% speak Hmong, and then 16% speak 18 other languages. So think about that, right? And we've been doing some work with them around grade level reading and, and our, our health and wellness program and the financial stability. And they loved us. Here's the community overall. 90% of the students live in poverty. One in four, one in four is one, right? And then you can see from the education levels there, Right? 34% have a high school diploma or some equivalent. 19% have less than. Right? That's half. That's half the population that the folks that live here. Right? And then if you look at the median income, well below. Well below. And then get this. There's not one major supermarket or healthcare facility. Right? So they're a food desert and a healthcare desert. I mean, that's a double whammy. So when we moved to square one, and we had these great aspirations that we were gonna really bring this work to scale, we had to set some guiding principles, not only in terms of the approach of square one, but also how we would determine who our partners would be. And this was a new phenomenon for our United Way, right? Very new. Because think about it. If you're gonna affect needle moving change, on a community-wide metric based on the success of our current efforts. And we had had some successes. And we were really proud, although they were really teeny tiny. We also had to believe that it was a long-term, multi-layered investment. That it, if, I mean, you can go, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you got to go together, right? And so we had to invite other stakeholders in. And not just school districts, and nonprofits, but funders. We had to have funders <coughs> sit with us to do this work, or else it wasn't going to get done. We had to believe in cross-sector engagement, right? We had to commit to using data. But more importantly, and this is really, really important, we had to commit to having community members as partners, planners, and producers of impact, right? We couldn't sit there and say, hey, you know what? We know what's best for you all. We know how to fix it. 
listen to us. We're going to make it happen. No. Because we were also committed to systems change, right? And sustainability. We can't be in one community forever. We also knew that we needed to bring forward the power that communities already had within them. Because I'm going to tell you, if you're a low-income person, <coughs> you're probably one of the most innovative people on the planet. Oh, yeah. Because just to make a creative game, you must be innovative, right? And you find all kinds of ways to work around your circumstances so that you can survive to the next day. We wanted to bring that forward. So, Square One Project, what is it? It's a philosophy, right? And it's built on all those principles. It's not a program, it's a philosophy. We had four goals, keeping kids in school, keep them up, keeping them on track, setting high expectations for their success, going back to the idea that they already have within them the power and ability to succeed, right? We just needed to help remove the barriers, and then ensuring that strong support. Because you know kids don't thrive if they don't have adults in their lives who are thriving, right? What does that look like in terms of the work? So keeping kids in school, one of the things that we learned in working with our partner in local school district is the high percentage of kids who are food insecure. And we also, we're able to draw a straight line between that and performance in the classroom. Attendance, behavior, all of those things. One in five kids in our region is food insecure, which is higher than the national average. Now think about this, we are Sacramento. We are the farm and board capital. We got a lot of empty boards. We should be ashamed of that, right? Our program serves thousands of kids over the school year and in the summer. As of July 2019, we we provided over a million meals since we started in 2014. A million, and we're just scratching the surface. Keeping kids on track. We all know this, and Crystal said it, right? If kids aren't reading at grade level by fourth grade, they're not gonna keep up, they're gonna fall behind. <coughs> and like you, Crystal, in our region, the grade level literacy rate is under 40%, right? In rural, it's around 38%. So we partnered with AARP, an experience court, and we recruited folks who are 50 and older, who are retired, to come into the classroom and work with students in small groups. The outcomes are clear. 62% of kids who started below grade level improved their reading and literacy performance after one year. One year. Setting high expectations. So you saw the demographics, right? I mean, high percentage of those folks, if they graduated from high school, right? And about 20% didn't. So how many of those folks do you think understand higher education, what it takes to get there? None, right? Our K to C college program has changed the conversation for those families. We can now talk to them about education beyond high school, right? Just by providing <coughs> dollar and college savings, those kids are three times more likely to go to college and four times more likely to graduate from college. And that, that can be any form of higher education, <coughs> two-year, four-year vocational technical training certification, right? Something that will enable them to get a job that pays them a living wage, right? So you talk about breaking cycles of poverty. <laughs> poverty is not generational. The challenges are. Think about that. So our local United Way <coughs> provides $25 to every kindergartner in the Roblox School District to start that education savings account. Oh, and, and get this. This is the really cool part. Our Young Leaders Society breaks the money. They raised fifty thousand dollars to start that program for us. Our young leaders. So, if you want to talk about how do you engage donors, how do you inspire them, 
we went to them and we said, hey, here are all these brilliant little kids. We have aspirations for their success. What did you want to be when you grew up? And what did it mean to you to be able to go on to college? And that sold them. And they raised that money. We now leverage that money into almost $400,000 through additional support. And we've ex we're going to expand it to over 1,000 kids. Strong support. So you heard earlier that one in four of those kids are homeless at any given time of the year. That is brutal. That is brutal. And so we've been working with the philanthropy to try to change that with some mixed success because there's no housing, but I don't want to digress. <laughs> but what we have had an impact is by providing the free tax credit services, we've been able to save those families millions of dollars and put millions of dollars back in their pockets. And we were, engaged, we were able to engage our labor community members who they know how to canvas, they know how to go door to door. And they went into these communities and knocked on those out to our Vita sites. And then we act as a connector and a communicator, right? So we had to step into our superpower as a convener. And we've been talking a lot about that today, right? What can we do? What can we leverage as a network, right? How can we bring people together to talk about big problems like homelessness? So we reached out to our partners in, in Woodland, and they are a whole separate United Way right in the middle of our area. And I know you all know what I'm talking about, because some of you probably have some of those. And we brought them together with IBM. And we said, okay, you want to have a B Tech high school, right? And it's a, and I know I'm going to get this wrong. Tom, you know what it stands for. No, I don't. But it's, it's a, a program in technical education, early high school, something like that, right? And so the goal is that students in high school, they, they enroll in this B-Tech program. And when they graduate from high school, not only do they have a two-year STEM degree, they also have internships and probably a paid job with an industry partner, right? We were able to make that happen. And then Center for Financial Empowerment, and so as we positioned ourselves through Square One as a poverty fighting organization, we teamed up with the city of Sacramento and we helped them get a grant to provide financial coaching as a free city service to any resident in the city of Sacramento. And the goal here is we want people to increase their savings, reduce their debt, be able to save for retirement, whatever their dreams are, right? Improve their credit scores so that they can lift themselves out of poverty. And it takes a lot of partners to do this, right? We have not done this alone. So it goes back to the power of partnerships. And I want to share two more, two final examples with you. Because while we can identify outcome measures, right, we also need to bring about systems change. And we also have to make it sustainable. So I have two examples I want to share with you of how in the Square One Project we've done that for the World War Park community. So first, results. Does Square One work? Yes, it does. Our kids in the Roma School District, they are exceeding, meeting or exceeding the standard in terms of their right? <laughs> both California and the county. And here's the school district, the poorest one in Sacramento County. Power Bridge. So, we dug into the data. And Crystal, I'm glad you talked about data because it's really important. But there's also stuff behind the data, right? Right? There's a lot that we don't know. And so we wrote the dug deeper. And what they found is they 14, 8.8% of those students are chronically absent. And that's high. That's hot. But it was for a reason that we didn't even think of. But the school district knew. It was because of illness. So think about it. It makes sense, right? They're in a healthcare desert. Right? 
right? And so when they're sick, parents have to come pick them up from school, take them as, as 20 minutes or more to a place where they can get care. The transportation sketchy. By then they've lost time from work. School days over. Kids not in school. Mark apps or whatever, right? Power partnerships, Sac County Office of Education, which is one of our main partners, they connected Hazel Health, which is a telemedicine business, with Rover. So now the school nurses collaborate whenever a child is sent down to the nurse's office. And in real time, using telemedicine, they can diagnose what's wrong. If it's something that the teacher can treat and send the child back to the classroom, he or she will do that. Parents don't have to come to work. Child doesn't miss, miss class time. As a result, kids who had a Hazel Health visit, 26% absentee rate was lower, 60% fewer absences. Power partnerships. We are now engaging in a conversation with the superintendent to determine how we can bring healthcare services to Roper Park. Because we got evidence, right? We got evidence. And we had a funder say to me a week and a half ago, I will pay for somebody to come in and do a feasibility study to determine what is the right way to bring health care services to that community. Is it a school-based clinic? How cool would that be? <laughs> right? Or is it partnering with an FQHC? Power partnership. That will transform that community. And then I want to tell one more story. We talk about how do we build the capacity of communities to advocate for themselves, right? So Roca Park, their community leader came to us and said, we need United Way to help us. And we said, okay, what do you need? They said, you know, we've been zoned for our little community, and it's not that big, but there's more land than there are. So think about that. It's a very geographically diverse community. A lot of farmland. There's industrial parks around it. And then literally in the middle of it are, there are neighborhoods. Well, they've been zoned for cannabis. Now, this is not an indictment of cannabis. I know it's legal. However, they feel overwhelmed by the number of facilities that they were located in their community because they've been zoned. So they came to me and said, we are going to oppose the 24th cannabis business. <laughs> and we need you to help us prepare for the planning commission meeting. We don't know how to do it. We wrote to the city council years ago about this. They never responded. Can you help us? And of course we said yes. So we prepared them for testimony. We got the word out come out to the planning commission meeting to oppose this, three times we went with them. And the third time was the charm. They denied the application. We were jubilant. More importantly, that community and their leaders brought forward their power. Now, it's not over yet. We still have some work to do. But that's an example how you can build capacity within a community so that they can determine their own destiny, right? So what did we learn? Lasting change requires authentic engagement with the community, defining the problem and determining the solution. We have to be willing to fail fast and together. We have to ask, don't tell. We have to humble ourselves to really hear what's important to the community members. That's the only way you're gonna to get to sustainability. Next steps. I feel like a rock star right now. I didn't know it, but I certainly feel that way. And I wanna maintain my rock star status. So what does that really mean? So we recently went through a merger with Woodley. Remember I talked about that little United Way that was well, after a year and a half of a lot of work, we're now one year after one. But we're gonna go in really trying to understand what are the most pressing needs in Woodland, right? 
Remember, square one is a philosophy. But how it shows up in communities will be different based on what the community needs. And the square one philosophy demands that we engage the community right from the beginning. Yeah, we're gonna have data that's gonna tell us some stuff. But we wanna have community conversations. We wanna gather the partners and we wanna together set the goals and objectives, right? So that we're not going in and saying, well, oh, the data tells us this, so we're gonna do that. All right, let's do it. And we're gonna ask these very specific questions and they're all probably very familiar to you. Now we're going to have lunch. <laughs>